All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Adam York. Uh, I'm one of the creative directors with A Stranger Concept Films, and uh, we're here in the No Fun in Filmmaking panel with Con Carolinas. Uh, I'm going to uh, pass this around to a couple of our amazing directors uh, in this panel, and we're going to talk about how fundraising works and how much and how little fun it really can be. I'm Michelle Antuano. I'm a director based out of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, currently, I've done four, five, five shorts and two features. I'm, I'm at the point where I'm losing count. <laughs> um, and it's been a mix of self-financing, crowdfunding. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's, that's the angle where I'm coming from, I guess. Uh, my name is Jason Buterin. I'm creative director of Mad Ones Films, which is based out of Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and I started about 2006. I think I made 14 short films. And then uh, I'm getting ready to hopefully release my first feature, which is Kill Giggles. Um, and we've done, we've done crowdfunding. Uh, we've done equity crowdfunding. Um, I rented out the space where my soul used to be, and they put a Starbucks in for a while until the whole world went tits up, and now it's drive through service only. Um, but yeah, we sort of, we've, we've, we've done it all, you know, voodoo spells and we've like rationed all and like sold things and auctioned things and all sorts of stuff like that. Indentured servitude. Uh, we've run the gamut really. I'm Christopher G. Moore, um, filmmaker living in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, I did the films Foodie, Disengaged, Knob Goblins, Got Punched, and now my newest film Backward Creep, which, uh, we're hoping to turn into a feature possibly next year. Um, so I guess, I guess kind of the first question, um, around here, sorry, I, I can never tell if I'm turning into a floating head or not, but, um, <laughs> but the, the first question I want to kind of float around is, um, what advice would you give to a brand new filmmaker just trying to start out about, um, what the easiest way to fund their small short film would be like? what would you do to reach out to, um, to somebody with zero experience and zero knowledge of what's going on? Honestly, I would be shocked if anyone here had anything different other than to, that we just self-funded our very first movie for basically zero dollars or like a hundred dollars that we just scrambled together from our savings account. I mean, I think that that's a really common story for getting started. And really you don't want to invest thousands and thousands of dollars in a film if you've never made a film before. I know a few people who have. I know a few people who their very first film, you know, they crowdfunded like ten, twenty thousand dollars and they went out and, and made this movie. Um, but I've I've heard mixed things. Like sometimes that really works for people and other times people are like, oh maybe I should have like started with a short. Maybe I should have started with working on other people's sets or something like that. I wouldn't have made as many mistakes. So when it's low risk and when it's low cost, you can kind of almost walk yourself through a film school experience where you there's you know you, you've invested nothing in this aside from your time so you're you're in the learning stages you can you can grow up to a point where when you are finally spending lots of money especially when you're spending other people's money uh you can actually make the best choices and not make any like major mistakes so as far as like scrambling together that initial like let's say 100 200 dollars for me it was just um you know out of my savings account but if you are like a paycheck to paycheck sort of person <laughs> we've got so many like gig economy things now to where i mean you could pick up uber driving like on the weekends for four hours a week you know for a couple months and see if you can scramble together a couple hundred dollars that way um there's a lot of little side hustles and stuff that you can do online now where you know, if you just want to get like a couple hundred bucks together to make your first film, you can you can pretty easily get that money together and do it. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm thinking about the story. You know, Michelle was mentioning the the side gigs online and stuff. But I, you know, one of my favorite stories is um, you know, Robert Rodriguez, Rebel Without a Career. I mean, basically, you know, sold his body. Him and Carlos uh, Carlos Gallardo sold their body into science. You know, I have a eight, friend eight, who funded his movie by selling plasma. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, he, he you know, sold his body to science for eight weeks to test his medication related to get the eight eight grand to be able to shoot El Mariachi. And I mean, that's just it's a fantastic story. Um, but I mean, I, I agree with Michelle. You know, the first few films we did, I mean, I I didn't have the slightest fucking clue, profanity number one, what I was doing. Um, I would argue, and possibly some of my cast and crew would agree with me that I still don't know what I'm doing. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have felt comfortable a a asking strangers on the internet for money, but at the time, all the way back in 2006, um, there weren't, you know, there wasn't the Indiegogo, there wasn't the case star. I mean, you basically, if you didn't have the money, you 
borrowed it from people or you, you found family friends or something like that to invest 50 bucks, a hundred bucks. You know, if you had a, a, a coffee shop or a club or a bar, you like to hang out at, make friends with the owner and be able to shoot there sometime when they're not open for free. You know, like there, there were lots of little things that we found, but I mean, to me, part of um, being able to, you know, the, the, being able to get to the point where we are now in the last few short films that we did, which we had a, a lot of success with as far as crowdsourcing, we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't spent those years self-financing and just doing a short film and then next time doing it a little bit better and getting a little bit better cameras and gear and lighting and just getting better as filmmakers to the point where I feel comfortable now asking for people to invest their faith and their funds in, in our work. But I mean, it's definitely a trial by fire and it's something, I mean, especially now, I mean, without, you know, I think it's something a lot of people look for with, with crowdsourcing, with, you know, uh, giving their money, their hard earned dollars to various, and there's a lot of projects out there. Number two, I know. Um, that I mean, without having that, 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 that pedigree, without having that previous work to be able to show people, to give people that, that confidence that they're investing their money in something that's going to happen, not just a pipe dream. Um, I mean, to me that that's important too. So I think it's a lot of those little things that just add up to being able to do it when you do go to crowdsourcing to do it and to do it right. Definitely agree there. I was just, I was just thinking how the first thing I ever, ever worked on uh, was a horror movie that was funded by a dentist for five grand. And the, the dentists director, have a lot of money. I know, right? <laughs> like, yeah, like, like I've always been amazed by that, but it was literally a, a big, uh, a, a big production, right. um, which, which I thought was, was kind of interesting. Of course, yeah. you know, when I turned in my budget for special effects, it was less exciting, but you know, um, cause I didn't have anything to play with there. I mean, the main thing is, um, especially if you're starting out, uh, you just have to look at what resources you have available. And hopefully, uh, whatever idea you're working on, making it to where it won't cost you a huge amount of money. Um, you know, earlier in my sort of filmmaking career, I, back in 2003, there was a KFC popcorn chicken contest that I entered. And it just cost me uh, buying a, a thing of popcorn chicken <laughs> and I entered it came in third place and won five grand so a lot of times it's all about your resources I know that w actually one of the first films that I actually put on the film festival circuit was a was an action comedy that makes fun of John Woo action films called Hard Stapled about this guy that falls asleep in an office and wakes up and everybody's like instead of guns are using staple guns and um uh, instead of knives or using letter openers and that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, that movie cost me $300 to make and it was all out of my pocket. I did everything myself. I directed, shot it, did special effects, sound effects, everything. Uh, I ended up winning, uh, went to, my first film festival I went to, we ended up winning best short comedy. Um, and I remember I went to Dragon Con. We got into the Dragon Con film festival that year. And I would, and they had two other uh, shorts that had like one of them was shot like on a Western sound stage and, and they all went like, what's your budgets? And this one guy's like, uh, mine cost, uh, I think one of the guys, one, mine cost $25,000. This is a short film. By the, way. <laughs> the other guy was, I think, uh, $13,000 and, and mine was, I was like $300 <laughs> and everybody clapped for me. So, I mean, really, especially when you're starting out, you know, sometimes you're just going to have to, if you have the, the passion for it, it, to do what they said, raise money. You know, uh, I, I've always, for the most part, put in my own money through most of my projects. And as you get bigger and bigger projects, build up a fan base, uh, get people that know your work and, and want you to be successful and they're willing to throw some money your way. You, you bring up a really, uh, a really interesting point, uh, especially for uh, writers uh, which is how important is it to write for your resources for all three of you? Um, Michelle, like, like, what do you think? Like, how much are you willing to adapt your script just for the resources you have? Like, I've got this really cool abandoned house. What can I do there? I always like to lead more with the resources that I have inside myself than the resources that I have outside myself. And by that, I mean, what do I know a lot about? What am I uniquely 
what is my weird, unique crossover of things? Um, and in the case of both my features, live scream, one was that um, I had an encyclopedic knowledge of Twitch culture and Let's Play culture and indie games from the past five years. Um, and I also had experience working in the Unreal Engine, which is a game engine uh, that you can design video games in. So those two like kind of weird, unique things for a filmmaker crossed over and allowed me to make this feature for very, very cheap. Um, and then with Detroit Evolution, which was my second feature, uh, I had the unique crossover of being very, very invested in this relationship, this, this fandom ship, Read 900, um, in the Detroit Become Human fandom. And I also was a filmmaker. So I was able to do something in that fandom that no other person had really done because there weren't really any other filmmakers in the fandom who loved Read 900. So, I, I do think that in the early days, like if you look at my first three or four shorts that were made for nothing, yes, I used my kitchen as a set. You know, I think my house is in all four of my like first shorts in different, like I've used every every room in this house at some point, except maybe this one. Um, so yeah, like you definitely want to use what you have, but I do think filmmakers sometimes get a little bit too caught up in the roulette wheel of, oh, I've got these three cool things, so I'll write something to fit that. And I think your writing should always come first. I think that you should always think about what do I want to say with my movies? Like, what do I, what, what kind of movie can only I make? And then go from there. There are certainly movies that I want to make that would cost a million dollars for sure. And there's a reason why I'm not making them right now. But I can definitely take the ideas that, you know, don't cost a million dollars and try to figure out like, okay, I'm passionate about this. How am I going to do it? Because especially with the feature and Jason knows this better than anybody. This is going to be your life for like three to four years. So you better make sure that you fucking love it. <laughs> you better make sure that this is worth three to four years of your life. Because if you are not passionate about it and you just wrote it to fit a set or like a cool car or like some cool person, you know, you're going to get really, really burnt out and might, might not even finish the movie in the end. Yeah, don't, don't write a feature film to get laid. It's just, it's not worth it. Kid. <laughs> Stay in school, practice, <laughs> practice abstinence or safe. I don't know. Be safe. Just be safe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, Jason, uh, uh, kind of keep going there. Cause you just got out of a situation where you had resources, but you had to go out and get a lot more and you were both writer and director. So uh, yeah. How yeah. much do you write for resources? So, um, with, and I've always even kind of sort of started off, uh, I tend to be very character driven. I, I obsess a lot about dialogue and just conversations and stuff like that. So I mean, I was, that was, generally tends to be my first sort of a focus, but the first few shorts that I wrote, I mean, I definitely wrote for what, what I knew we had available. And so I let the imagination stretch a little bit, but I got lucky because I had a lot of filmmaking friends that I knew had done a lot of stuff. So I knew they had access to places that I didn't know about. Um, I played in bands, you know, most of my life. So it's like, I've always, I've made friends with other bands. So it's like, I, I had the luxury of having music for movies or be able to have, get into bars and clubs and stuff like that. So it, it kind of opened up the range and maybe some people would get normally, oh, I'll kill you guys. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I definitely got lucky, but with Kill Gig, like there was, and there was one, the first feature I ever wrote was called War of the Living Dead. Um, and I wrote it and we found people were gonna go ahead and get ready to shoot and everything was gonna be awesome. And then um, the people that were going to do it read it and realized it was complicated because there's like massive fucking space battles and like all these like thousands of zombies and this action and massive and, and massive everything that so there was just there was no possible way we could have pulled that off. I mean, we weren't we weren't experienced filmmakers enough. It was just it was a pipe dream. It's still a cool script and I, I'll polish it up some. But with Kill Giggles, I mean, I had to there's a lot of I've got probably like six boxes full of composition books full of clown death. Um, just stuff that was way too complicated and expensive. And like, I mean, I wanted the streets to run red with the blood of clowns and we came close, we came really close, but there was a lot of stuff in Kill Giggles. I mean, I just, I had to scale back. Um, and it was a matter of the, the first draft of the script was 300 pages and I wasn't done writing yet. Um, so I had to scale back quite a bit from there. Otherwise I would have had like an 18 hour documentary narrated by Ken Burns, you know? Although I probably would have been able to afford Mr. Burns, but that would have been pretty cool too. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I still have to cut back. And I think you kind of, there's there's a happy medium there between just sort of writing for what you know you've got and writing for what you want or what you want to go after. Not for what your dream thing is. And now you're like fucking Fast and the Furious and 8 billion cars and massive crane. We're going to blow up a fucking building. 
I think I've exceeded all my panel cursing counts now. But I mean, there are certain things like I mean, I wanted to draw and quarter a rodeo clown. I'm like, I don't know where we I don't know anybody that has any rodeos or anything like that. So we went to a couple of places and ended up going out and then shooting at the Dixie Classic Fairgrounds in Winston Salem and just massive rodeo. And it was like it was it was amazing. But without the resources that we'd gathered over the last 14 years, we wouldn't have been able to the point to be able to ask for it or to justify filming there. So it, 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 it's a give and take, I think. I don't I think if there's something that you want that is moderately reasonably accomplishable, I think it, it's worth going after if it makes the story, the film itself stronger. If it doesn't, like Michelle said, like you're just doing it because like I want to do this or I know like my uncle's got a 68 GTO what does it do for the story? Is it about like, so, I mean, it's just, if, if it's not relevant, if it's just, if it's superfluous, then you're wasting a whole lot of people's time. Very true. Very true. Uh, this a, big, is tough. a big John Wick fight scene was the thing that I had to cut out of Detroit evolution. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted this giant, like one fight scene that like lasted for five minutes. And uh, yeah. And it's just like, no one missed it. You know, it's, it would just have been cool. So one day. <laughs> I've actually got a, I've actually got a couple of scripts that are, they're, they're kind of like steampunk, uh, and it's just not going to happen for me anytime soon, if mm, ever. But uh, I, I think that's the thing about it is you just kind of keep keep going there. Well, I mean, a lot of times uh, when I'm working on my own scripts, I do think about what resources I have at hand. Um, I've had a few times where um, I worked on, I worked with another person who'd come up with the initial idea for a script. And then we had to change it uh, based on, um, you know, making sure that we have the right resources at hand. And then sometimes, you know, you see, you see the script and you're thinking, okay, what people, you know, friends and family, who, who do I know that has this resource? Like, you know, uh, for, uh, for foodie, uh, uh, Eric uh, Pruitt, who wrote the script, he used to be, he was a manager at a, uh, seafood place and so he he had that in for us to shoot in a seafood restaurant for a scene um and uh you know i've had other things like disengaged we needed a neighborhood because i wanted to be a very spielberg type story and i had a friend who lived in a really nice neighborhood in wake forest north carolina and uh his neighbors were all cool i mean it was a pain in the butt for sound stuff when we shot outside because we didn't realize during the weekend all the crazy stuff that people do <laughs> like jumping on trampolines and playing and stuff was it was it worse than knob goblins no it was not worse <laughs> as, it, it was Are not you? as worse and and knob goblins is another thing my, my for good friend uh, doc rotten with gears magazine um we needed to shoot in a basement and uh, he's like i've got a huge uh basin mary under his house and we just went in decorated it made it for their scene um and that's one of those things to where like it was all quiet in his neighborhood when we went out to to look at the place but the day we shot there there was people building a house across the way that they, they have like a pathway behind their house so there's people on bicycles running you know big wheels they were uh, we had planes there was an air like, show woodpeckers like, and i think i think and this was november and there was an ice cream truck too and i was like where it who has an ice cream truck in November? This doesn't make any sense. But everything, you know, yeah, you have to figure out what's the best place to shoot. I mean, um, Gut Punch, you know, when it comes to locations, one of the guys uh, that was actually in Knob Goblins, uh, Christopher Holdsworth, he actually supplies alcohol for for restaurants. And so he had an inn for a uh, downtown um, beer uh, restaurant in Raleigh. Um, so we were able to shoot there. And then I was like, you know, I have, a, I, have a, I have a short film that involves a sex montage. Uh, I will just shoot it in my house. <laughs> uh, of course, I ended up having to fix my air conditioning after that because of just, uh, we had it put plastic everywhere. And for some reason, it, it heated up my house and blew my air conditioner. But at the same time, I didn't have to pay for any fees. Uh, I didn't get the people mad at me because, you know, these people are, are doing fake sex acts in your house. Um, other than my, my, you know, I'm in a town home, so I'm sure people next to me thought I was having sex all weekend. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah. all about, it's all about stuff. And, and usually because I work in horror, usually my biggest expense is usually effects. If, if it involves mm -hmm. like a big effects, I mean, uh, with backward creep, my newest film, the effects for that was, was basically three fourths for our initial budget. 
because I had, and that's m- probably my stupid idea because I had this really cool effect that's like the money shot in the very end of the film. And I really wanted that to work. And, and um, uh, the guy who was going to supposed to do it before it was actually working on the show Doom Patrol, but he had to back out at the last minute. And I got Matt Patterson who had some friends that recommended him and he did a great job, but it, it cost a good amount of money, but it was worth it in the end because that's the biggest expense because location wise, uh, Amanda uh, Stone, who's our producer, um, her dad owns uh, this land because he works in construction because we needed a road that their car stops on that we could shoot at night. And it's all, it's all fenced in. So, you know, we could shoot there because we, it, it was a whole night shoot every night. So it's, it's all about making sure that, you know, you know, if you, if you write a script, don't, I mean, if it's got spaceships and all these different things, unless you are really good at uh, w after effects and you can do that stuff your, yourself, that's cool. But when it comes to anything that involves budgets, effects and that stuff, you have to think that out. And, and it's, hopefully you have enough people in your, in your friends uh, or social media that you come across. Um, you know, even music, my, my good friend, Houston Rogers, who I grew up, with in high school, I met him at Crimson Screen. He actually lives in Charleston, and we reconnected. And now he's like, he's my music guy. He, he made music for Backward Creepin', and I wanted something that sounded like uh, Haunting a Hill House type music. And he created something really cool for that. So yeah, it's it's all about your resource, not only resources, but the people that are resources for you to use because they want to help you make your stuff. That's a very good point. That actually leads into to my next question here. Um, uh, what, the, the, the first thing I ever learned about filmmaking is it is a lot more expensive and a lot less expensive than you kind of expect um, in terms of what you end up paying for locations and crew and effects and, and all of that fun stuff. Um, but a lot of what I've worked on, uh, we've gone through uh, some type of fundraising or some type of drive to bring in funds. Um, so what I'd like to ask now is more about what's your experience with online fundraising or asking people for money or, you know, how do you, how do you approach those situations and what's worked and what hasn't for you? Um, so my, I guess going down the line so far, um, everything, all five of my shorts, well, let's say four, four of my shorts and then one of my features was completely like pretty much self-funded the only two that have a bit of exterior funding is like one one short my husband was just like i'll pay for it so technically that's also self-funded but i didn't have to pay the bill so (laughs) in my mind it wasn't um but but detroit evolution was extremely crowdfunded all seventeen thousand dollars of that budget was completely crowdfunded i didn't have to front anything for it so that is my experience with raising money from a group but i did it very differently than most filmmakers do. Um, I did not run a Kickstarter. I did not run an Indiegogo. I did not run any sort of like brief, like big perk oriented campaign. Uh, Basically what I did was one of my shorts, Detroit Awakening, which was a short um, 15 minute film that I put on YouTube that was a fan film in that universe. Uh, I was almost like a proof of concept. It was kind of like, hey, I made this movie for $1,400 of my own money put it online. Uh, People liked it. People begged me to make a sequel. And I was like, all right, guys, if I'm going to make a sequel, you guys got to pay for it because I'm tapped. So I set up a Patreon and I set up a coffee. I also think I had like a PayPal donation portal if you just wanted to give me money through PayPal. And coffee is interesting because it's micro donations. Uh, You basically could donate $3 at a time. You buy a coffee, so to speak. And uh, I first... I did experience it a little with live scream. Um, I did not raise capital for live scream, but I did r- do a little fundraiser for film festival submission fees for the film. And I was like, this is just, you know, if I can raise a little bit of money to help with that, that'd be great. So I did this thing where I was like, if you donate a coffee, if you donate $3, 
um, I will let you write a, a chat username to be used in the little side chat of live scream. Cause in the film, there's a, there's an on-screen chat for the whole movie that, that scrolls through the film and I needed usernames for it. So, uh, a lot, everybody who donated got to invent their own username to be in the chat. So it was like this little tuckerization sort of perk that uh, would allow you to put in the movie. And I ended up raising $175 that way because people were very actually invested in being a part of the film, even for a little bit of money. So back to Detroit Evolution, um, we did the, the coffee and we did the PayPal thing. Patreon requires me to invent perks and give bonuses. Like I have different tiers. I have uh, $1 a month all the way up to $50 a month and each require me to offer different things. Uh, and then eventually I got partnered with YouTube, which means that ad rev on my films or uh, ad rev on my videos can go to me. I got uh, affiliate on Twitch, which means that I can stream games and I can do the Twitch thing. That's why I have this beautiful studio um, is because I do Twitch streaming and people can subscribe to me uh, for two dollars and 50 cents a month goes to me um and then i also started a merch store and i was selling merch so i had like six or seven different income streams like going on to raise money for this film and it lasted about eight months uh to raise all seventeen thousand dollars for it so it was a very slow burn uh, my audience is very young they're not the type of people who most of them can just like throw two hundred dollars you know thousand dollars here and there but over time I ended up having over 65 people who gave at least a hundred dollars over the course of those eight months. Um, and I guess the other thing like worth mentioning here crowdfunding wise is that after we kind of met our green light goal, I did introduce a program called producer perks, which basically said if you've cumulatively donated 100, 250, 500 or a thousand dollars over this eight months, uh, you get like extra stuff, like a Blu-ray of the film, a signed poster, a prop from the film, a signed script, like the sort of perks that you would typically do with like a Kickstarter at high level donations. And that was really successful too. I ended up having four different people uh, donate at least $1,000. So um, that was even more successful than I expected. So my big thing with crowdfunding, I suppose, is number one, people are often very very generous in ways that you don't expect and also even though it seems like okay i have a signed version of my screenplay and i signed it and that, is this worthless like do people care about this they do <laughs> they actually like that it, that does have value it's not bullshit like it's it's not like even though you're an indie filmmaker and you're not George Lucas and you know, you're not gonna go and you know, have your props in a museum or something like that you know, for $250,000, this is still a part of the movie and your fans will appreciate it and, and have faith in the fact that they do actually wanna help you. And, and a lot of times it's not even about the perks, they just wanna see the movie happen. <laughs> <laughs> Funded. Funding. Um, <laughs> yes, um, but yeah, with our shorts and stuff, it, it sort of started with, um, I did a thing called a, a short film trilogy called the gospel according to booze bullets and hot pink Jesus. And mm -hmm. the first one was sort of self-funded through a couple of uh, very generous donations. And then um, that was right when uh, there was Kickstarter and there was Indiegogo. And I liked Indiegogo just cause I like things that end in go, go. So <laughs> I, went back, so I was like, okay, why not? Um, and you know, they had, they had two different, there was and at that time, cause there was just the two different, the two different options for crowdsourcing. I liked Indiegogo because they had a, a, a fixed, a fixed campaign and a flexible you know, the fix, if you set a goal and you met it, you got everything. If you didn't meet it, you're, you got nothing. Flexible, you know, if you didn't meet your goal, you still got something, but it took a slightly higher percentage. And to me, I was just like, any money raised is money I didn't have before. So, it, you know, and, and that, that seemed to me to just sort of be an intuitive thing. Like, it's money you didn't have before, so go after it. And getting in, I, I think, at that early time when it was sort of, I mean, I, I saw, you know, a lot of filmmakers make a lot of the same mistakes um, and then just get have disappointing results with their campaign. And, and a lot of it came down to, and what, what I still think to this day is that with the crowdsourcing campaign, I mean, if you're not going to put almost the same level, the same amount of work into the campaign itself as you are into the film that you're asking total strangers to give you money for, then, I mean, you're just, you're, you're kind of dead in the water before you get started. Um, you know, I see a lot of filmmakers, you know, that have just, they'll put up uh, the one stagnant poster, you know, the, the, the promo concept poster and the one paragraph about this and the money's going to go for this and, 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 and everything. It's very, it's not, not detailed. It's not informative. It doesn't give you a sense of the story of the passion of why they want it. 
why do they want to make this movie in the first place? Why do they need money for this? You know, our, you know, don't phones have cameras? Can't they use that? I mean, to be able to explain to these people, it's like, I want to do this vision, or we want to shoot with this kind of a style, or even just saying, yeah. you know, saying, fuck it, we need money for craft services. I could respect that honesty, you know? Um, but again, it's just, it's putting that vitality into the campaign where you're asking people to give you money. And, and, we, and we sort of did that with um, one of the acts of the Hot Pink Jesus trilogy with Between Hell and a Hard Place, uh, with don't let the light in. And then um, we did it. We actually, we did a proof of concept for kill giggles, which was called killing giggles. And that one, um, I just asked a couple of people that had given us money before if they wouldn't mind just ponying up a, a little bit of cash. Cause we were going to, you know, shoot a, a proof of concept for a feature and everything else like that. And it, it worked out really well. Like it did, it did. I mean, I think we, we pulled that together for not a whole lot of money at all. I'm like 500 bucks. I think in one weekend, maybe a grand. So I had to pay for a circus tent out of Kersey Valley. Um, but I mean, it just, it, it looked amazing, but I mean, it gave us an amazing proof of concept. So we had that on the film festival circuit at the same time while we had the screenplay on the screenplay competition circuit. So it was just, it was a triple pronged approach between those two things and then me babbling anytime anybody would give me a chance to, to tell about this idea that I had in my head. And when we spent, I mean, as, as Michelle said, I mean, I spent, you know, years just writing the script and get everything whittled down. And then, you know, we spent, you know, a few months shooting the proof of concept stuff and then another year, year and a half raising money and raising awareness and doing all these articles and getting all the, you know, being very fortunate and very lucky to get these amazing press opportunities to the point where people, they could look us up. They could look at the movies we'd done before, you know I mean? They could see there's a, we have a pedigree, we have, you know, a, a filmography out there. We have award-winning works out there that, that show just how serious we are, are you, and hopefully communicate our passion. And with Kill Giggles, we kind of did a couple of things different. Like we did, we started off doing equity crowdsourcing, which is, I think it's becoming a more popular thing, but at the time, I think we were the second film that even tried to go that route, which is more, you know, selling shares in the film. And it's, it's a mm. tremendous amount of pain in the ass paperwork. Like I was in bed with the SEC for months. I mean, it was just crazy. All the amount of stuff you have to do because it's, it's much more, uh, prof I don't know, not professional industrial, just more high dollar, more high value, I think, than a lot of the perks that you see with Indiegogo where, you get a, a shirt or you get a poster, or you get a signed copy of the script, or you get a, a movie prop or something like that. Like it wasn't perk based at all, but we, we, ra we raised a good chunk of change. I mean, that was the first good chunk of production budget that we had. And then we did an Indiegogo on top of that because I wanted to be able to have the perk based promotional items that like Michelle said, a lot of people just go after. And again, I think putting the creativity into those perks. So it's like just not just the coming up with things from the movie that mean something or that will mean something to somebody that watches the movie is just, Another one of those little things that filmmakers can put into the campaign that really makes it stand out, I think, which is getting harder to do every day. Uh, on that, would you recommend to, I'd say, like a slightly experienced or established director to look into um, equity funding, or was it such a pain in the ass that they'd be better off to look at other routes? Like, what, what are your thoughts? On that? Um, I mean, I think it, it's worth pursuing, but again, I mean, if you can, cause I mean, and it's, it's a, I mean, you, yeah, it's a tremendous amount of paperwork, but knowing, knowing now what they're sort of looking for. So, but I like, they're definitely, and I did, I mean, I have the business acumen of a sponge. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Um, but luckily I have, I have very, very uh, brilliant people that, that do, um, so, I mean, it's just like a massive amount of paperwork with the IRS and the SEC and stuff like that. I mean, effectively, I say you're, you're selling shares into it, but it, mm -hmm. it's just like with Indiegogo. I mean, if you put, but it, you know, it, it's, it's like Indiegogo, but it's different because at that point, you're kind of going after the high dollar investors, you know. Um, you know, the Indiegogo is great because you can, you can have like the $1, the $5, the $10, the, the $200, the 5000 You can kind of go up. This, I mean, you know, 100 bucks a share. I mean, that's you know, for some people it's a drop in the hat for others. That's three bills and some food. I mean, it's, or that's a whole month. I mean, that, that's a large chunk of change for some people. Um, so we, we, we sort of aimed it at a higher dollar and it required a different style of writing. I mean, just a completely different style of promoting. I had to go and do a bunch of research on horror movies and, you know, like the last, the last, you know, the box office returns on horror films for the last 10 years. I mean, and all this kind of stuff to be able to, cause they, they'll, they'll, those kind of people want numbers. They could honestly not give two lessons of a shit about your movie. It's a one of a kind idea that they don't care. If yeah. they give you money, how much are they going to get back? You know, it, it was it was sort of being able to justify to sort of turn the lens from the passion of the film into I think it's going to make money. Maybe my mom likes the idea. So I mean, you've got you've got to write for a whole new audience. But if you can do it and you've got the people behind you, I mean, it's it can raise you a, a really good chunk of change. Uh, Chris, let's uh, let's hear about your adventures in crowdfunding and um, sourcing uh, sourcing dollars. So, and babysitting. 
babysitting. Adventures in babysitting. I went yes. somewhere weird. I'm sorry. Yes, I forgot my Thor helmet. Um, uh, well, the uh, I know that um, with some of my earlier stuff uh, with Foodie and Disengage and Knob Goblins, we went the traditional crowdsourcing route of creating like, I think we did a, I think we did a, I think we did a Kickstarter campaign for the first one, I think, Foodie. Um, and I feel like uh, with each uh, campaign, I've made less money. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing the wrong thing. But I think also one thing you have to realize is that um, there's always a boundary if you don't go outside of your family and friends, you can't always depend on uh, your normal circle of people to fund everything. If you're really going to be successful, you have to create an idea that's going to make other people interested in it, in it. Um, people that you don't know. Um, and uh, I think with some of the, some of the things I, I, I probably went a little bit, uh, crazy with some of the, because I always thought, oh, if you create some kind of cool thing that we can give away, the people are going to be into it. I know with Knob Goblins, we made like a, um, a uh, uh, what I called a knobble head, but it's uh, where the, <laughs> the bobble head is the creature uh, on the guy's junk. Uh, and I thought it was a very funny thing. And the guy who created uh, uh, the Annabelle doll, uh, he actually created him for us. And uh, Rosen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause he thought he thought it was a funny idea. That's it's great. It's like one of my favorite things, um, but um, they didn't really sell as much as as much as I thought. I thought they'd sell out pretty well. Plus, you have to think about the cost of things. Because not only do you have to, if you create things, the cost of how much it may it costs to make, and also how much it costs to ship. And if you don't think about that, you may not get a lot back in return. So I think if you're, if you're going to create things, sometimes it's good to create more digital perks. You know, and there some people uh, do the things like uh, doing, having them do a shout out video or, or sign post or something that doesn't, it's not going to cost a lot of shipping. Otherwise you gotta, you gotta make sure that perk cost is going to cost a lot because you have to take shipping into cons in consideration. Uh, you also, if, if that also comes to <laughs> I was going to say, just shipping internationally is... Oh, well, that's already to say. International, you have to take that yeah. into co bigger consideration, yeah. uh, especially now, because I know, I know some people that had like a, 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 a eBay shop or whatever, and they had stuff that was stopped at customs because of the whole COVID stuff. Um, I would hate to be doing crowdsourcing right now and <laughs> having to ship out perks because I'd be pulling my hair out. Um, so, uh, you know, I think those are kind of cool, especially if you can build up a fan base. I, I mean, I love what Michelle's done with her, her uh, Patreon and stuff, which is something I, I, people keep telling me I should do or doing something with that. But I don't mm -hmm. know. It, it worries me because I feel like I'm going to have to be so prolific at always creating stuff all the time. Um, but I, I mean, luckily, I've been, I've been pretty lucky, at least with the last two projects, to where the people that were involved actually chipped in money. You know, I've had, of course, I've had to spend my own money. Um, with, uh, uh, especially with backward creep, when I brought, uh, uh, ish, my DP, and then I brought in, uh, Blake Fawcett, who I've worked on some of the beatdown boogie stuff, uh, with their YouTube channel, which I, I was lucky enough to be a part of. And back when YouTube used to make a whole lot more money than what it used to once they changed the rules on that. Um, and, uh, they, 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 they both, they both chipped in money. Um, which is very helpful, but especially when we, when I was looking at estimates for cost of effects and stuff, because I, I think a lot of times you really, you know, if you're not able to spend money in certain areas, at least spend it where it matters. Um, and, and having the right people matters as well. And so, uh, so yeah. And, and with backward creep, I was sort of doing what, what Jason's done with his kill giggles and stuff. Uh, when Michelle's done with hers, you know, where they create these little, shorts or whatever to sort of sell the bigger picture of what they're going to be working on back or creep uh we did that almost like a proof of concept we want to say this is the this is the 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 this is sort of like the basis for this character who kills people it's going to be our sort of like uh jason or freddy but more of a female super villain um yeah. you know we really went and went into like the, the the look of it with the you know with the lighting uh, we really wanted the the money shot of the end, which you know we really don't reveal too much. Uh, although if if you look right here, it may give a little <laughs> hint. Um, but um, 
uh, yeah, we wanted to really sell it. And so we really want to have money. And so uh, we actually, I actually, again, spent my own money to have a screening for our cast and crew. And then I invited a few people to the Alamo draft house. And I invited, uh, there was one person in, in specifically that I'm friends with that I know actually funds things or whatever. He's funded actually Hadestown, which won Best Musical. He actually was a oh, wow. funder of that. Um, and so I invited him to it. And um, he talked to me afterwards, like, I want to find your thing. Uh, which, which is funny because it came up to me. He's like, you know, I, didn't th- I wasn't sure if this is going to be any good. <laughs> Because, you know, you know, because he probably gets invited to a lot of things and they're like, hey, come up to my thing. And they don't see it's good. And, he, and he's like, this is really good. I want to, I want to. And so we have to, we actually, Amanda, actually my producer, Amanda, I'm going to work on the feature script with her. We're going to work on that together and come into that and then create um, what we need money wise to make a feature and present it to him and see what he, what he says. So I've never really had that luxury of finding people. I always wish somebody would drop into my lap and say, Hey, (laughs) here's all the money in the world. Um, Which, you know, my friend, yeah, friends with beat down boogie. They used to know a guy who told him like, Hey, I want you to make a zombie film. And he brought like a big bag of cash. And I'm like, why can't I have those type of friends in my life? Um, So yeah, it's, 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 you know, funding stuff is very, the most frustrating part for me. You know, I would love to be a, uh, born into the lap of luxury, but I haven't. You know, I've, I, I, you know, I have lots of credit card debt and stuff because of my trying to fund my films because I believe when I, <coughs> I'll, I'll keep making movies even if I don't have money. Um, so it, it's, it's all about just finding the right people. And I think a lot of it is, you know, you may not get all that money in the beginning, um, but if you keep making films, keep, you know, uh, uh, creating a, a bigger amount of people that you're connected to. Uh, you, you're going to find those people that believe in your art and are willing to give you money, you know? And, and, and I think also one thing I did do with um, this new one is I did a thing where if you gave certain amounts, you can get like a producer type credit, these quasi producer credits. So I did have a few people that actually reached out to me. Hey, I want to, I want to help fund it. I even got my chiropractor to uh to give like a hundred dollars to it so i was like hey you know I've, I've, if if sam Raimi can get his dentist to do it you know i can get my chiropractor so now i feel like and because my film is a an ode to sam Raimi, i feel like that whole thing is cir- cyclical now or cyclical or whatever that is um you made me th- uh, think of something else about crowdfunding that I, I think is worth mentioning to anybody watching um there is another route of crowdfunding if that is not Indiegogo and and the sort of perk based, but it's also not equity. It is uh, donation based, meaning like mm. charity donation based. Uh, this is called fiscal sponsorship. This is actually what we're using to fund uh, our next short, Fame Fatale. And so this is a route that's really good if you are going to like chiropractors and dentists and rich people or semi-rich people who might have a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars that's burning a hole in their pocket. Um, they don't want to just give it to you a lot of the time. They either want to give it to you and get money back, as they did with Jason, or they want to give it to you and get a tax write-off for it. So typically, if you have a chiropractor or whatever who's just like, I just want to like give you money, you know, just to make your movie or whatever, he can't like write that off on his taxes unless you're going through a 501c sponsored body that says we are a charity we can accept this donation and that way they can write it off on their taxes Uh, the easiest way to do this is to go to a site called fracturedatlas.org this is the fiscal sponsorship for fame fatale literally all you do is you pay a ten dollar a month membership fee and they have a lot of benefits like you can post on backstage casting calls for free which is twenty dollars $25 $25 a you know, casting call normally. So I've like made my money back just in that. Um, but it's $10 a month uh, membership. And then you just apply. You're just like, hey, I got this project. Here's the script. Uh, here's you know how much money we're trying to raise. And they pretty much approve like everything. I mean, as long as you have a project to show for it, they'll, they'll pretty much approve it. And then you know the people who are donating, they just go through that portal and they donate and then they get the receipt back and they can write it off on their taxes. So uh, that, I just wanted to mention that as, a, as an option because it was a very long time before I even knew that that was a thing. And if you do, the reason we're able to make that one work is because I don't know any rich people and I don't like asking them for money. Uh, but my co-producer and writer of that film, Michael James Daly, is a canine masseuse. And a lot of his clients are a little wealthy because 
they're getting their dogs massaged. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so he's gone to a lot of his clients and, and that's pretty much been his funding source for that film. And I, so far we've raised like $6,500 for this, oh, this nice. short film. So it hasn't been that rough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one other thing too, like, cause we, something that both Chris and Michelle said, but like um, for aspiring filmmakers going into the crowdsourcing and stuff like that, if you fail your first time, and there's a strong chance that you will, because before, you know, when we started back in 2006, there was Indiegogo and there was Kickstarter and that was it. And it was for bands trying to record albums, people trying to make movies, whatever like that. You, uh, I invented to do American cheese snack idea. And then, I mean, you know, people will go money for that. Now, I mean, there's everything under the sun, like GoFundMe and I don't want to pay my bills.com and someone else be an adult for me. Org. Um, there's just this massive inundation of stuff like that. If you don't, if the campaign doesn't go the way that you think it will or the way that you want it to, beware of social media and do not go out and start blasting people and yelling at them for not singling out your campaign when you only made one blast, you know, one social post every week. You can't expect them to flock to your campaign because there are a thousand other people out there that are going to put way more, way more time and way more effort and way more energy to get their attention for six seconds than you just sitting there waiting on your butt, waiting for the money to come in. So if it doesn't, if whatever, if you raise half of what you set out for and you have a flexible thing where you could, you, you get to keep that money, be fucking grateful, say thank you. Um, and then show people what you can do for that amount of money. Or if you know, um, if you, you can do a, a I've seen filmmakers that, that will do multiple campaigns for the same, for various phases of production and stuff like that. So to be able to show this is what we did with the money we got the first time, help us do something bigger for this part, to be able to show what you did with it, what you're going to do with it, and what, what you, where you can go from there. But beware social media because it, it, it works against you. It works for you, but works against you so much quicker. So just be nice is the thing I would say. <laughs> well, I'd like... I'd like to just point out that everybody on this specific panel um, promotes like crazy. Um, I think all three of y'all are, are amazing filmmakers, partially because you put so much energy behind your projects and it, it makes other people interested in them. Um, and I've noticed that from all three of y'all on social media. It's actually, it's actually really cool. Um, and, and you do a good job. Really yeah, I try, you know, so, I mean. I find ending with exclamation points helps, you know? Oh, um, but, um, <laughs> stop yelling at me! Yeah, I know, right? So, you know, that, that actually kind of kind of covers into what I was going to ask next, which is, you know, how do you reach out to people and how do you interact with them when you are asking them for money? Um, we have 10 Jason, seconds each to answer because Jason's like, Jason. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to avoid uh, the file yeah, being yeah. like five gig. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. So, all right. Um, but, but just in closing, I'd like to say that Jason, Jason pointed out something that's extremely important, which is be grateful. Um, you know, once you've got people supporting you and once you've got people funding you, be grateful for their support because even if that person, if that person gave you a buck or if that person gave you a million bucks, they're the people that are helping you realize your dreams. Um, and, and, so, follow, and follow through on your, if you get funding for something, oh, follow yeah. through on it. I, Deliver I, I, your purse. I, I know of a few situations where people didn't follow through and they, I've seen situations where they took money that didn't do anything with it other than mm -hmm. buy themselves stuff. And so, you're, you're all you're doing is hurting the rest of us that work really hard to gain people's trust. And then it makes people less trustworthy of, of getting money to the next filmmaker. So follow through on what you're doing. And, uh, cause you know, you know, <laughs> it just, it, it hurts. It hurts me to see that happen. And save, um, a, save a bunch of money for film festival fees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like just oh, like, <laughs> that, that should be off. part of your budget, right? There. Double your numbers just automatically and save half of it for film festival fees. Because <laughs> that adds up pretty quickly. I added up all the ones for Back of Creep that I wanted to submit to, and I was like, holy crap. <laughs> I think for live stream, it was about 2000 in the end. Yeah. yeah. For some of And I, I had restraint. <laughs> When I, I had a whole bunch for, for I had a whole bunch for kill giggles and now they're all dropping like lies. I'm like, oh, honey, I feel so bad about this year for you. <laughs> I don't know, the world premiere next Saturday and then stupid Rona. Oh, <laughs> but there are good things in the works, so we'll see what happens. Uh, thank you guys for uh, showing up, and you know this is you know keep watching for more Con Carolina stuff. Bye.
Bye, everybody.